Hello, everyone. I am Chris Hoquist, the Associate Director of the Center for Immunology here at the University of Minnesota. Welcome to the first session of Mini Medical School COVID-19, The Way Forward. We're excited to have you here today, and we look forward to guiding you through our first topic in the series, COVID-19 Vaccines, Variants, and Evolution. To introduce you to the Mini Medical School, we have a video message from Dr. Jacob Toller, Dean of the Medical School and Vice President for Clinical Affairs at the University of Minnesota. Good evening and welcome everyone to the Mini Medical School, which is gonna be terribly exciting this year. It's gonna be about COVID-19. If you look at the COVID-19, if you look at the past year, it is almost unbelievable what happened. We went from a sequence of a virus that was unknown to science at the time to billions of effective vaccines in a, less than a year. This has simply never been done in the history of science, in the history of mankind. You are in presence of something that is not just a scientific event. It is a human event. It has offered, as we reflect, recalibrate, and rethink how, th how everything happened, it has defined the way we're going to think about biology, medicine, society for years and decades to come. So your tremendous opportunity tonight and in the nights that follow is to see and hear from people who were doing the science and doing the clinical care and looking at the societal impacts of COVID-19. How was this done? Because it's clear, I think, that in these challenging times, the science led the way. And the progress has been swift and prolific and embodiment of what humans can achieve when we put our collective minds and efforts towards making a change that matters. There's no better place that I can think of than academia. And land grant university and its medical school is exactly the place where this work can happen. The virus has tested local, state, global community. And then many, many of you have faced anxiety through this. And uh, I think take some satisfaction, some, some, some hope from the fact that we've been able to provide for the society what we are here to do in the first place. It is equally important that there has been unequal distribution of hardship and loss across the communities and professions that last year that drew our collective attention to inequities that already existed. So this is not just a slideshow. This is an invitation, invitation to discussion, invitation to a, to a place where we can understand better, not just the basis of the disease itself and its impact on humans, but also how do we grasp these highly charged questions that need to be answered in the healthcare system, in our society, and for all of you personally? So thank you for being here, and thank you for attending the Mini Medical School this year. Enjoy. Okay, we have this set up tonight as a moderated discussion with Q&A to follow. Please note that this session is being recorded and will be uploaded tomorrow on the Office of Academic Clinical Affairs YouTube channel. I encourage you to review the material on the Mini Medical School website for additional information in this and future sessions of the Mini Medical School. Please note that this is the first of three sessions. The next one on February 22nd is on advancing health equity during a pandemic. And the last one of the series on March 1st is on COVID long haulers. Today, 
We have the pleasure of hosting a panel that will be discussing how the COVID vaccines were developed, their safety and efficacy, vaccine resistance, and new variants of COVID-19. If you have questions for the panelists or me, please type it in the Q&A box and I will pose it to the panelists. And now to introduce our panelists, I will first bring in Lou Mansky. Dr. Mansky has extensive experience researching human viruses and how they mutate. He is director of the university's Institute for Molecular Virology which for the past 11 months has been part of the university's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Mansky, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your interest in viral mutation and evolution? Thanks very much, Chris. So um, as Chris mentioned, my name is uh, Louis Mansky. So I've been involved in uh, humbly speaking, virology research for 35 plus years now, which uh, seems longer than I would like to admit to, but it's been a few years now. Um, in the 1990s, I actually uh, was uh, led the charge to define the mutation rate of HIV, which had previously not been determined before. It's, a, it's actually a complicated process to actually figure out how quickly a virus mutates. And this is, most, this is something that most people would recognize as being a rapidly mutating and evolving virus as, as HIV. So my, I've been interested in studying virus uh, genetic diversity and evolution for many, many years, as well as other aspects of virus uh, replication, primarily with uh, other human viruses prior to March of last year when we began studying SARS-CoV-2. Thanks, Lou. It is my pleasure to bring in Ana Nunez. Dr. Nunez is the Vice Dean for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at the university's medical school. Dr. Nunez has extensive experience addressing vaccine and inoculation distribution in equitable and fair ways to communities that most need access. Dr. Nunez, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and your interest in COVID vaccine attitudes and how they can limit access to certain communities, particularly people of color? Sure, Chris. Well, thank you, uh, everyone, for uh, inviting me to this panel. I think it's a really wonderful opportunity to engage in the discussion. Um, as you mentioned, I'm a professor of medicine and general internal medicine, um, joined the university August 31st. So I'm, I'm pretty new to Minnesota and learning about all the wonderful things that's here. Um, in a similar fashion to Lou, uh, I've been working in terms of prevention and community participatory research for about the same amount of time, uh, trying to figure out while we do things, how do we make it actually land with populations that sort of it makes sense in terms of addressing sort of inequities. Um, vaccinations are interesting um, entities. Uh, first, you have to buy in that prevention matters um, and that we can sort of intervene to make a difference. And then you have to sort of understand in terms of how the immunology sort of manifests for a, a lay person, uh, which isn't necessarily the easiest thing. Uh, but be, being able to traverse and deal with some of the myths and some of those barriers are incredibly important. I mean, people wanna understand symbolically what vaccination means. They wanna know how does it all work and they wanna know how to manage it in terms of being well-informed. And we see lots of members in the community um, who really are hesitant and wanting to be informed and the job's on us in order to sort of have those conversations. Thank you, Dr. Nunez. We're glad to have you here tonight. And now, Jason Barron. Dr. Barron's an assistant professor at the College of Pharmacy, the University of Minnesota Twin Cities campus. He also practiced as a community pharmacist for 22 years. Dr. Barron, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and your interest in vaccine development? Well, thank you very much. First of all, I'm very happy to be here with Drs. Hoquist and Mansky and Nunez and all of you out in our audience. Um, this is a great forum and uh, we look forward to this discussion. Um, I grew up on a dairy farm in upstate New York and I'll come back to that in a second and moved out here as a rock and roll musician and decided I better find something else to fall back on. Uh, I earned a BS in pharmacy at the University of Minnesota and practiced from that time, which was 1992. Um, as a community pharmacist um, up until a few years ago. Um, 
So going back to where, where I, I, when I came to the university, I, I came as in a variety of roles as assistant professor, as well as director of alumni relations, uh, because I, I really enjoy having relationships with uh, other professionals and, and, and people outside of the, the college. Um, going back to when I was on the farm, uh, in, in terms of why I'm interested in vaccine and, and the bigger picture of educating people, um, when I was a a kid, we each got to claim our own cow as our pet. And I had one that was a doctor cow. It was all white, mostly white. And we would have to provide vaccinations to them when they got sick. And I remember watching in horror as my father uh, provided an, uh, a, uh, an injection, uh, probably an antibiotic to my doctor cow. And that was, now that was a needle to be afraid of, let's put it that way. Um, but uh, um, I remember thinking why he was doing that and why would he do that to my cow? So fast forward um, to when I was practicing at Cub Pharmacy for several years, I was a clinical pharmacist there and we had this wonderful relationship with the Minnesota Visiting Nurses Association because this was before pharmacists were vaccinated. Um, and they would arrange one to two days a week to, or during the, the, the winter to come in. And there would be people lined up around the entire store. We had to put seats up because people were waiting in line for so long. And that was wonderful. Um, however, I had patients that I had known for, for many years that um, would not, did not want to get a vaccination, did wanna, did, didn't think that a, a flu shot was a good idea for them or their families. And I remember thinking, what is wrong with them? What, what is their problem? And as I went on through my, my career and then I have been at the college thinking about how to, to, to educate people, it becomes obvious to me that it's not their fault or it's not this individual's fault if they're feeling like they don't want to get an immunization. I think the responsibility falls on me and the other people that are involved with them and so what I try to do is work on teaching our students as well as, as our pharmacists and other healthcare practitioners is that that um, relationship is, is so important. And if you want people to take your word and to trust you, you need to be educated in what you're trying to um, talk to them about. So that kind of is where my interest in vaccine production, because in order for me to qualify that I know what I'm talking about and that they should um, believe in, in what I'm saying and trust it, I need to have that information. Thank you. Okay, let's get started. Um, we'll begin with COVID vaccines. For the past few months, we've been inundated with news about different types of COVID vaccines. Dr. Mansky, can you briefly describe the different types of COVID-19 vaccines that are currently available and those close to becoming available? Sure, happy to do that. Um, so let's go through the, the various types. So the, the ones that people are most familiar with are the, that have already been given emergency use authorization, EUA uh, approval from the Food and Drug Administration are the uh, mRNA, vaccines that those are produced from either Pfizer, which was done in partnership with BioNTech and also the uh, company in, in Massachusetts, Moderna. These are actually, uh, the way that they've engineered the, the, these are vaccines that have never been used before. It's the first time it's ever happened. It's actually a, a pleasant surprise that it actually even worked. Uh, the, I can tell you as a virologist that most of the virologists were suspicious as to whether or not, this is such a new technology, it wasn't really clear if this was something that was ever gonna work out. Some of the other candidates I'm gonna talk about that are in the pipeline were ones that the virologists more favored based on previous data. So this is uh, one of the huge achievements in this pandemic was the success and really resounding success of these vaccines. It's just astounding how effective they are in terms of eliciting an immune response. So the way that these are engineered is that they have a, what's called a messenger RNA, and this encodes for the spike gene of SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus, the coronavirus that's, that causes COVID-19. 
So they, they take this RNA and encapsulate it in a what's called a lipid nanoparticle. And that's what's put into the vials that if anybody in the audience has been vaccinated, this is what's in the in these vials. Uh, RNA by, uh, in a purified form is very unstable. It will degrade very, uh, very easily. So it has to be encapsulated in these uh, lipid nanoparticles. I should point out, uh, which is the channel back, Dr. To a couple of comments that Dr. Tolar made, which is the the importance of academic research in in driving not only the the development of these vaccines, but a lot of the important scientific achievements that have occurred during the pandemic related to the pandemic was primarily fueled from knowledge and information that came from federal taxpayer dollars that was supporting government agencies like the National Institutes of Health and National Science Foundation in particular, that most of the achievements would not have been possible if it had not been for a particularly basic science that had been conducted at universities just like the University of Minnesota Medical School. Uh, the details of how the, there's a lot of detailed basic science I don't want to get into, but um, that was done with other viruses and other knowledge that was needed to be able to make the RNA and to do this in, a, in what's called a cell-free form, but it's a, uh, there's an enzyme that's needed that's called an RNA polymerase. In order to do this on an industrial scale, they have to make kilogram amounts of RNA. So at least for those in the audience that might have a scientific background, they'd realize this is just an unbelievable, massive scale production of an RNA that's never, I don't think it's ever been done like this so quickly before, but there's a lot of basic science that went into being deployed to make this all work. So these are the two uh, RNA vaccines. These are the ones that are being currently administered right now. Uh, the next ones are the, uh, the viral vector vaccines, and this is the AstraZeneca, which, uh, so the, the two RNA vaccines we know are the, the ones that there's, there's two shots that are involved in that. Uh, the British call that jabs, by the way. Uh, there is some ongoing debate right now that might uh, elicit a question or two related to whether or not there should be just one uh, shot now and then try to cover as many. This is an ongoing debate right now in the scientific community as to how we should be dealing with potential variants that might be circulating right now. And we'll, we're obviously going to be discussing this uh, during the, the mini med school. So the so let's move. So those are two shots the way that they were approved for the EUA. Uh, the two viral vector vaccines are the AstraZeneca, which is uh, two shots, and then the one uh, that's from Johnson & Johnson, that's supposed to be uh, just one, uh, one shot. So these are engineered uh, viruses that are actually respiratory viruses, and they're called adenoviruses. Adenovir these are not, uh, they've been engineered, genetically engineered to encode for this uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike gene. Adenoviruses in general, the, the, we're, we are, we've all been infected by, adeno, by adenovirus. They cause at best a mild cold-like symptoms. There's probably at least a dozen different respiratory viruses that can cause the common cold. Uh, this is one of them, it's a relatively mild cold. The, the viruses that they're using though are actually not human viruses. They're viruses from other non-human primates so that they will help to elicit immune response along with the spike protein. So these were the, the vaccines that the virologists thought would probably work because there was actually a fair amount of uh, data with other coronaviruses where they have engineered the spike protein into them that indicated that they actually generated a really strong immune response. So the vir this, these were the ones that were, the, uh, were thought by the virologists that might be more favorable. Uh, Novavax, which is another company, they're developing a subunit vaccine. This is a, a purified spike protein of uh, SARS-CoV-2. And actually the universe, this is in uh, phase three clinical trials right now. And actually the, our medical school is involved in a phase three trial for the Novavax vaccine right now. And so this is a, a, a purified protein. They also encapsulate this in a lipid nanoparticle with a, a saponin-based matrix adjuvant. So this is ongoing right now. It's a little bit farther behind. And then farther behind that are weakened or inactivated uh, vaccines. So this is a more traditional approach to developing vaccines. So there's 
probably at least eight, eight or nine, if not more, that are in this pipeline. And obviously, as more are rolled out and are more available to the American public, then we'll feel a lot better. But there's going to be more discussion of this as we go on during the uh, this mid 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 mini med school session. Sorry about that. But I'll stop right there. Thanks, Lou. And can you tell us how COVID-19 vaccines protect people by producing immunity? Yep. So the, they can uh, produce two types. Uh, it's actually Professor Hoke uh, could easily address this question as well. But uh, there's two types of immunity. Uh, they can generate antibodies. When that there's one of the issues with generating the antibody response is that there could be certain types of uh, mutations in the virus that could cause uh, mutations that actually neutralize the antibody and prevent it from being able to bind uh, to incoming virus. And this is obviously one of the concerns that we have uh, right now. But there's also a cellular mediated response. So there's two types of memory responses that can help to remember uh, the virus based upon these different vaccines and are all targeting the same spike protein. There could be other targets as well, but all these vaccine candidates that have either been approved for emergency use or other ones that are in the pipeline are all geared towards trying to generate an immune response, either a, a humoral antibody or a cell-mediated response against this spike protein. Great. Okay, let's move on. Dr. Varin. With the Food and Drug Administration's work to expedite COVID-19 vaccines, there's become an increased interest in the development process as a whole, particularly when it comes to their safety. Can you tell us how vaccines are commonly developed and how that process was changed to roll out COVID-19 vaccines so quickly? Yeah, I can try. Um, one of the, the things that, uh, um, that this happening so quickly, because normally it takes years, 10 years um, from development to putting the vaccination into an arm. So you can understand while people were a little bit um, apprehensive and, and curious about how this could happen so fast. Um, I think uh, I, I'm very grateful to have individuals like um, uh, Dr. The Fauci who, who became very trusted with telling exactly the way he saw things. Um, but when you hear that we're going to develop this, we're, we're faced with this incredible danger, this, this, this uh, um, invasion as it were uh, by a vaccine. And we need, to, we need to figure out some way to deal with it. And um, we're coming up with uh, um, a title of warp speed, which is, is good. It, it identifies how we're going to uh, put all of our emphasis into moving forward, but it also kind of uh, gives the impression of maybe some shortcuts. Um, right to to do it faster than you normally would, um, and I'm not criticizing that one way or the other. I'm just saying this is the, the impression that some people may get. Um, however, what they did is is and as Dr. Mansky pointed out, a lot of this work that we're seeing right now that are attributed to the the pharma companies, and thank goodness that they've they've put the time and effort in. A lot of this background work was done at the university level, at our land grant universities and, and other universities around the country by some very uh, um, uh, really good science. Um, I believe that the, the well, since I um, um, SARS, which was in 2002 and MERS, which was in uh, 2012, kind of gave us uh, a heads up on how we ne needed to start thinking about um, situations like this. So I think our past history, our experience with, with vaccines and immunization and the new technology that kind of ties into it as, as Dr. Mansky outlined, um, have really provided an opportunity where we, we were very fortunate to be at that point. Um, the next step is once we have the opportunity to have a, a vaccine that works, or in this case, several, um, is how to get it through the process to make sure that we're, we're, we have safety in mind. Um, and that's normally what takes a, a great deal of time is putting it through the different clinical phases of the, um, uh, the approval, the FDA approval process. 
And uh, to just shorten it up a little bit, you've got phase one, which, which tests the dose in just a very few people um, to see if, what, if they experience any major side effects. Um, if it's a dose uh, dependent uh, medicine, they would increase the dose until they have side effects. In this case, um, that's not exactly how they did it in, in step one. But in phase two, they roll it out to a, a larger contingent of, of several thousand people. And again, this is through all of these phases of clinical trial, there's an emphasis on safety. If there is a red flag that pops up about safety, that's going to halt or, or, or at least slow down the procedure. Um, and if it goes well in phase two, then in phase three, that's where they roll it out to thousands and thousands of people. So in this case, thousands and thousands of people actually had the vaccine um, and they're monitoring for efficacy, um, safety, and it, we wanna make sure that not only is it safe, which we've figured out from previous uh, uh, phases, is that now that it's going to be effective to some extent, we wanna know that, that we're gonna get some benefit out of it. And also by rolling it out to these thousands and thousands of people in phase three trials, um, it gives us a much broader range of people who have a variety of genetic differences, socioeconomic differences, um, all sorts of different uh, lifestyles and such. And it tends to pop up uh, potential problems uh, much more effectively than in a small group. Where this vaccine got to market so quickly was everything that we've talked about up to this point. But in a standard FDA approval process, they need to continue and finish phase three trials and then present the information they've got from the trials back to the FDA, which is, this is an ongoing process that they're involved with, with every step of the way. Um, and then the FDA then decides if, if this is something that is, is uh, where the benefit sharply outweighs the potential harm. Um, with an emergency use authorization, which it's important to understand, emergency use authorization is not an approval. So in an emergency use authorization, there has to be an emergency declared. And what it does is it allows the scientists at, these, at the FDA and the CDC and everybody to gather around and review this information and see if there's a problem. And even though they haven't completed the phase three clinical trials in many instances, they've got enough data from a large number of people where the scientists can look at previous history and the way things are going and decide if the benefits are gonna outweigh the potential harm. Um, and if that's the case, during an emergency time, they will authorize emergency use authorization. Um, the emergency use authorization is not an approval um, it lasts until the emergency is withdrawn or one year after the initial approval, at which point they, they can um, restate that if, if so desired. But the companies that are already in use, the Pfizer and, and um, the other vaccines that are coming out, even though they're, on, they're, they're being used right now, they're being used under emergency use authorization. And if the emergency were to go away, which hopefully it does very, very soon, um, they would not be able to provide the vaccine because until they made it through the final process and got final approval on these vaccines, which they are continuing to, to, to do simultaneously with the vaccination. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> Dr. Nunez, one hurdle that we have seen emerge is around COVID-19 vaccine attitudes. Why is there so much uncertainty surrounding COVID-19 vaccines? So I think there's actually a lot of uncertainty in just vaccinations, right? So we've heard in terms of how vaccines work, um, putting it a different way, our bodies are smart enough that if we have a foreign agent, we say, okay, we're going to get rid of that. And we're able with vaccinate vaccinate vaccines that we're able to give people something to sort of say this thing when you see it next time get rid of it right and so we take advantage in terms of how the body works in terms of being safe um, recognize that that's you know sort of not something that you'd come across every day in terms of understanding sort of immunology and how the body works um, so it's 
obtuse. It's not very accessible for a lot of folks. Um, the second piece, and, and Dr. Varen sort of talked about in terms of sort of the time frame and the tempo in terms of having these vaccines come out, you know, the, you know, warp speed sort of approach or whatever, um, hitting all those important milestones, um, getting people to engage in terms of doing the research so that we could stem the tide of thousands of people dying every day. Okay, part of the, you know, it takes 10 years in terms of getting vaccines is that we aren't usually in pandemics for the next sort of thing that we need a vaccine for. And we have the time to do the studies to enroll tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people in terms of as we move forward. But every day, we have to do something now to sort of make a difference. Um, and so I think that that's sort of a piece in terms of what's happening here. Usually when we want to do things in the health of the public, we have a really robust communication campaign, right? Think about Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Uh, think about anti-smoking campaigns. There's all these communications as to what it is and how we should do that. Um, for lots of complicated reasons, that didn't happen. Um, and so therefore, left to the void, what, you know, we had social media and sort of lots of misconceptions and ideas sort of fomenting about in terms of what this all means. Uh, we certainly know as of May that we the, uh, the pandemic of racism was uncovered. And so we have a duality of a pandemic of COVID and a pandemic of racism, seeing people disenfranchised. The essential workers after sort of those frontline healthcare people who they couldn't stay home uh, because they're delivering sort of takeout or they're work working at the grocery stores. And these are predominantly vulnerable populations that are sort of on the edges in terms of having to take a lot of risk, but not necessarily being sort of at the front of the line in terms of sort of being uh, attended to in terms of being safe. So we know that there's lots of inequities out there. And historically speaking in medicine, we have a pretty tainted picture, you know, be it the conquistadors and putting smallpox in, blank, in blankets uh, to kill sort of indigenous folks and onward. The history of medicine is not one that necessarily has been warm and fuzzy to lots of people of color. And so to be able to say, trust me, I'm a doctor, um, in terms of sort of doing something, people are like, uh, time out, what do, what's this about? Um, it's important that we engender trust in all the communities that we work with. And that means developing those relationships. Um, relationships take time to develop and you have to sort of understand how different folks are. Do they respond to their elders? Is a place of worship the best place in terms of getting that message? Is it print media? Is it social sort of media in terms of doing that? And so we have to sort of address that and also address the distrust in terms of sort of, um, you know, the, the issue in terms of sort of medicine. I, I think one of the things that we can all do at time of sort of getting vaccinated is take a picture and post it and be an ally and say, join us, right? In terms of being safe, join us in terms of sort of engaging uh, because there's lots of uh, really sort of um, strange <laughs> things in terms of misconceptions that out there, um, which are not true. Um, and yet we are put at risk in terms of not getting vaccinated in the light of some of these variants, something that's gonna detract us from moving forward in terms of sort of being healthier. So the more people we can sort of vaccinate, the better, but it's about making those relationships, acknowledging sort of the history of medicine, and speckled history in terms of communities of color and working together in terms of saying, how do we sort of move this forward? Um, there's always been sort of concerns in terms of vaccines. You're experimenting on me. I don't wanna be a guinea pig. Those things are long lasting because there were prior to rights for individuals who collaborated with us to engage in terms of research, there were bad acts before rules were put in place of sort of not doing that. And so we have to sort of acknowledge that as we move forward and have these conversations so we can stem the tide in terms of these deaths. Yeah, so Dr. Nunez, in, in your, as you see it, what part of our communities specifically could be most affected by this hesitancy here in Minnesota? Well, so lots of times what we're talking about is those who are at the highest risk, and that includes community of color, um, individuals who are older, um, and it goes back to sort of, we have to sort of be allies, we have to be upstanders in terms of making connections, um, we have to be available to answer questions in terms of what this is. Um, you know, I, I was talking to sort of a group of folks and they said, well, we had an insufficient number of black people that are in, in the, the trial. And I said, 
you're right, we need more. But the question is, who's gonna come join us to help do that? Um, representation on clinical trials only happens when we have individuals work with us and collaborate with us in terms of doing this and moving together. Um, so there are individuals for whom English is second language, immigrant refugee um, folks as well, who are sort of disconnected, um, individuals who are undocumented, who are concerned that if they go to a place um, that perhaps they'll be deported as they go to try to get a vaccine. Other individuals that, you know, if the vaccination only happens Monday from three to five and they can either go get their vaccine or lose their job, what are they gonna do in time of sort of COVID? Are they gonna lose their job? or are they going to sort of go get the vaccine, right? So we have to also exert our influence in terms of policies so that we make access when we have some more vaccines, make access more equitable so people can sort of achieve them. Um, but we have a, a, far, a vast swath of our population really sort of at risk, usually the ones that are at high is risk for morbidity and mortality. Thank you. Dr. Mansky, we've seen over the past couple of months new COVID variants um, come out of the UK, Brazil, South Africa. How will these variants influence the current and future COVID vaccines? Well, that seems to be a the question of the day, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I, at least for since I I gave people my introduction, you might you may have guessed that I was certainly one person that was not surprised at all. Um, that there, were, at some point we would be de discussing uh, genetic variants of the virus. I can actually tell you a, a somewhat unamusing anecdote that I had, was involved in writing and submitting a grant this summer that was reviewed in maybe early to mid fall. And one of the, it didn't get funded, but one of the reviewer comments was that, you know, we don't need to be doing any more sequencing right now because there's already a bunch of sequences that are available online. You could just analyze those and yeah, I don't know why you want to do more sequencing. And um, it, that is kind of frustrating that, that that did happen, by the way, but the, at least for somebody with my background and experience studying uh, virus mutation and evolution of of viruses that it was just inevitable that this happened. And if you wanna know why, why are these viruses mutating so much? It's just, in th it's part of their inherent properties that viruses do this, especially ones that are called RNA viruses, that it's part of the, the engine that drives the, the synthesis and making more copies of the viral RNA that is prone to making mistakes, it introduces mutations. And what happens is when we're, there's no time to get into this, I've been trying to answer some questions in the Q and A, by the way, but there's a lot of questions right now. Uh, but I'll go back later and try to answer some more as I can. Um, so when the virus we got transmitted into humans, it generated, uh, it starts adapting to the new host, which is humans. And a lot of these mutations that uh, that everybody's focused in on are in the spike protein, particularly in a region that's called the RBD, which is the receptor binding domain. And there's two things about this domain that are of interest. One is that uh, this is the this is the the domain that interacts with a part of the cell on the surface that's called the ACE2 receptor. This is what the virus is grabbing hold of in order to get in to cells in our nose and our upper respiratory tract and then down into our lungs. These mutations, um, so the concern is that the, the virus is mutating and we're hearing this information, for example, with the UK uh, variant, that's called the UK variant. What that All that means is that that was the first location on the planet where somebody sequenced it and identified the string of mutations. It, it, the, we don't know if it first arose there. It could have been in the United States. It could have been in China. It could have been in Australia. We don't know that. So when you hear these names, please know that we don't know where it first arose. We just know that's the first place where somebody sequenced it and identified that those mutations that arise in the spike protein. So there's there's two ways as to why the virus is is adapting, you know, collecting these particular mutations. What you know what you're hearing is that the virus is doing that because it wants to spread more efficiently. Viruses can be very smart, very clever. If this virus was really smart and really clever, it wouldn't cause disease because there's no advantage for the virus 
to harm its host, right? It just, what does the virus want to do? It just wants to exist in nature. It, it has one purpose in life, make more copies of itself. That's all it wants to do. It doesn't actually want to harm the host. It doesn't make any of us feel any better during the pandemic, but it doesn't want to harm humans. It just turns out that one of the off targets of its replication is that it's causing disease and causing pathology, but it doesn't necessarily want to do that. Uh, so apparently this UK variant does turn out to be more, it's probably bind to at least what's, it's not been all figured out. What is, what I think is likely happening is that it's binding more efficiently to the, the receptor binding domain and the spike protein is binding more efficiently, more tightly to the ACE2 receptor, which means that if it's being transmitted from one person to another, it's probably making it more efficiently able to grab onto cells in another person and another person infected. These same mutations though, curiously enough, are also mutations that arise when you see a, a, a neutralized, uh, when, when, when the virus evolves to be resistant to antibodies, so it can't be neutralized by antibodies. You, uh, people have figured out, sci other scientists have figured out, you see these same mutations, and more likely than not, the reason why we're seeing these mutations is not because the virus is trying to be more readily transmitted from one person to another, but it's trying to resist these antibodies that are trying to prevent it from just infecting the cell. And it just turns out fortuitously enough that these same mutations are allowing the virus to grab a hold of that ACE2 protein and be able to enter into the cell. So there's still a lot of this that's being figured out right now in real time. There's a lot of mutations out there. Somebody asked in the chat, are we, you know, what percent of those that are testing positive are being sequenced right now? I don't know. I, I don't know if, uh, probably have to ask somebody at the CDC, but I don't think we're sequencing enough in this country. Uh, there's been discussions about that. Obviously, it's getting ramped, as you can imagine, now it's being ramped up quite a bit, not only in this country, but many countries where they have the technology to be able to sequence. What you're going to find is that there's a lot of variants out there. How important they are is all going to be dependent upon uh, looking for certain mutations now that we're starting. There's a collection of them that turn, turn out to be important that are in this receptor binding domain. There may be other ones that are important too that we haven't fully figured out that are also in the spike protein. They could be else somewhere else in the virus too. So there's still a lot of room to figure everything out, but all the focus is in this one area and that helps to differentiate in this receptor binding domain that's differentiating the UK variant from the South African variant from uh, the isolates that are coming from Brazil. They're all folk, there's all mutations and there's a lot of them. It's just not one or two, there's clusters of them eight or nine mutations. So we still haven't figured out all of them, but there's several of them that always show up and they all they fortuitously turn out to be associated with uh, resisting neutralizing the antibodies, which is what my guess is that that's the reason why they've been selected for, because that's something that's stopping the virus from doing something. And viruses will mutate to get around obstacles, roadblocks, like an antibody. That makes sense. It, yeah, it could make sense too that they're smart and they're trying to be able to, to be transmitted from one. They are pretty smart, but they're probably not that smart. But it could be that the reason why they're they could be more uh, more pathogenic and cause greater disease that if they bind to the ACE2 protein more efficiently, that could allow them to spread more efficiently with in a lung. So that might be a reason why. I've not heard anybody say that, but it would it might make sense as to why they might be a bit more virulent in certain instances. Thanks, Lou. Sure, an arms race, isn't it? Okay, very quickly before we go on to answering questions, Dr. Varin, why should we be confident in receiving one of these vaccines? And you want that quickly, huh? Um, <laughs> um, well, uh, let's say you know, let's let's look at it. Um, you know, the government. Our government, like any other government, is imperfect, but it's pretty darn good. The vaccine is imperfect, but it's pretty darn good. And the process of, of taking care of each other in this country could be better, but it's not the worst. So let's, let's think about that. How can we um, uh, feel more confident. Well, I, I'll start out by, by showing you this, which is shows that I've gotten my first vaccine already. 
And my second one is scheduled for this Thursday and I invite anybody, uh, I'll, I'll be making a video because one of my concerns, which Dr. Nunez alluded to is vaccine hesitancy. I'm trying to do everything I can to make people understand that number one, I trust the vaccine and the science behind it. I trust that 485,000 people have lost their lives to this. Um, that, that you know is a fact, that, that's, that's the fact. I may not get full protection from my vaccinations. And you know what, if I get 25%, I would go to the, the store and buy a lottery ticket if I had a, a payoff like that, and I, I guess you would too. But um, there's two additional things I wanna, I wanna point out is that like masks, wearing masks um, not only help you, but they help everybody else that is around you. And we need to think about those people. Um, there's some people who uh, may not be able to get the vaccination. There's some people who are more susceptible to the disease. But where the masks help um, uh, protect not only ourselves, but those around us, the vaccine does the same thing. And it's so important that you become advocates um, and don't shame people. If you have a cousin or a friend and they say, I'm not getting the vaccine, instead of saying, well, you know, you're, you don't know what you're talking about. Ask them why they feel that way. I wanna know why you feel that way. And then have a conversation with them and, and just point out the, the facts of the situation. Because the more people we get vaccinated, the more quickly we reach that herd immunity, at which point, it really slows down the potential for these people who can't get vaccinated from getting sick. And then the other thing, which I'll tie back to um, uh, um, Dr. Mansky's conversation is that mutations can only occur if the viruses are replicating and being passed back and forth. So the sooner we shut this virus down, the less likely there's going to be mutations that we have to deal with down the road. So please be advocates for, for it. And if you haven't gotten a, a, a vaccination or are not planning on it, please reconsider and, and talk to your friends and neighbors as well. Great, thanks Dr. Barn. All right, let's start with the questions. And we've just heard about why we should get this vaccine. So the first question, um, I think Dr. Nunez, I'd like you to answer this. How can the science and medical communities get the trust of populations that are nervous to take the vaccine? So we should do it, but how can we get that message out there? Great question, great question. And part of it is instead of just sort of sitting back and waiting for them to come to us, we need to go to them. Um, if it's a testing site, if it's a vaccination site in the community, if it's a place of worship, if it's a social center, um, getting out there and sort of meeting with people and having conversations. Um, I think the one of the most powerful things in terms of sort of changing people's hearts and minds is having that relationship, having a conversation with you in terms of sort of, why do you, you know, why did you get the immunization and why do you want this in terms of the safest choice? We have to build, build those relationships. Um, we have to not make it be that we're over here and others over there. We have to start making those connections and so that they become, we become sort of the trusted other, that we sort of engender trust in others. But that's all in the basis of relationship. So it can't be from afar. It can't be phoning it in. Um, it can't even be Hollywood Squares. A little bit, maybe. You could sort of start some relationships like this. Um, but certainly it developing relationships and having conversations with people where they live. Um, and where they, you know, sort of thrive. And so going to all these different places in the community and sort of offering and talk about health education, uh, because oftentimes a lot of these vulnerable communities are like, boy, you think COVID? Me getting evicted from my house is a bigger deal. Or me not understanding how I can get asthma medicine for my child is a bigger deal. And engaging in those kind of conversations that have to do with 360 sort of health, um, COVID being sort of one of those things, can be really pivotal in terms of figuring out how can we be allies and sort of try to change that tilted, uneven playing field. Great, thanks. Okay, this next question, I think I'll take that field this. It's please further explain humoral versus cellular response in the two available vaccines. Does cell mediated immunity last longer than humoral? Well, basically when we have immune responses, there's two types of lymphocytes that respond. And the B cells provide humoral immunity. That means that they make 
these, and they secrete these um, small molecules called antibodies that float throughout the body, and they can prevent the virus from infecting a cell. The other type of lymphocyte called a T cell um, provides the cellular immune response and T cells can actually bind to other cells of the body that already are infected and eliminate them. So we need both of these angles of, of immunity, but as you might be able to appreciate that humoral immunity, those antibodies that prevent the binding right up front um, is uh, really a very strong basis of building a vaccine. Um, does cell-mediated immunity last longer than humoral? Um, they probably are equally long-lived, although we don't know the answer to that specifically um, for SARS-CoV-2 yet. We're, as time unfolds, we'll know the answer to that. Okay, next question. Um, and Dr. Mansky, I think I'll ask you to answer this one. Are there possible long-term unintended consequences of inserting RNA in our cells? Yeah, I tried to, to type an answer into that already, but um, uh, simple answer is no. No. <laughs> oh, I like it when it's that simple. <laughs> but, but you could answer about like with these uh, viral vectors, the viral vectors that I was talking about, the adenoviruses, those are DNA viruses. Because uh, I know people have concern, like, could the DNA like, go into the nucleus of our cells and be integrated? Uh, adenoviruses are linear DNAs. They don't normally do things like that. They don't get integrated. So they do need to, in order to replicate, they do need to go into the nucleus of our cells, but they don't, they don't integrate. So there's really no major risk of that happening either. But uh, the RNAs, all they need to do is to go into the outer part of a cell, which is called the cytoplasm. And they just get, uh, they get recognized and they make the spike protein and that's their job is done and they'll they'll get degraded in the cell and that's pretty much it so it's pretty pretty simple pretty safe another thing i can point out real quick because it relates to this is that these vac the two rna vaccines do not have any preservatives so that means uh, at least for for jason since he's gone there and been vaccinated and for any anybody in the audience that gets vaccinated that once so these vials are have multiple vac multiple doses in each vial. So once they, uh, you know, uh, disrupt the rubber seal, they have to use it all that day. It's it's only good for six hours. When they thought it, they can keep it and use it up to five days, but once they've gone into it one time, they've got six hours to use all the vaccine doses. There's no preservatives. So it's all the only thing that's in that in that liquid that you see in the vial are these lipid nanoparticles and RNA. So it's a real simple formula. It's one of the simplest vaccine preparations that's probably ever made. Some ways I wish they just called it a, ther a novel therapeutic than a vaccine. There would probably be less concerns about it. Uh, just the word vaccine conjures up to some people a lot of concern, but it, it's a novel therapeutic. It does elicit an immune response, but. Here's a great question that I'll open to the whole panel. Is there any evidence yet about contracting COVID after having the vaccine and then being able to transmit it to others? Has anyone, does anyone have information about that? Lou? There, yeah, there's no data that that has happened. There is a concern that, that you, we just don't know enough yet. There's not enough, been enough people that have been vaccinated where they could, that you could potentially be you know, because the immunity, even though the immunity for these RNA vaccines is really high, right? We hear these numbers, 90, 95% effective. That's just astounding. Like if you look at an average year, the flu vaccine, it's usually between like 40 to 60% effective. So to have these vaccines be 95% effective, it's just crazy that they, they are so effective. But even though that's the case, it is possible that somebody that has been fully vaccinated, like soon Jason, after, after a couple of weeks, after he gets the second shot, he would be considered to be fully vaccinated. It's still possible he could get exposed to the virus. And even though he won't probably develop any symptoms, he could still spread the virus to other people. And if they've not been vaccinated, so there's still not enough science and enough data to know for sure if that's really a risk or not right now. So the answer, the simple answer is we don't know, not yet. Thanks. And, and I would add to that uh, with with that point is that 
I will still be wearing a mask and, and social distancing until there is evidence to show otherwise. So I, I hope everybody else does that as well. It's a great recommendation. And it may be sort of an issue. I'm sorry. It may be an issue to double mask in terms of sort of the variants being out there. Um, so not only just masking, but maybe even double masking in terms of the variants. Um, let's let's take another couple questions here, right about the virus biology. Lou, can you clarify? Um, is the Johnson and Johnson vaccine based on deactivated COVID nineteen virus? If not, what what is it based on? So I think there's still some confusion about the Johnson and Johnson one. Yeah, the Johnson Johnson one. That's the one. That's one of the ones that's based on the adenovirus. So it's a genetically engineered ad adenovirus where they've inserted the the gene for the. Uh, the coronavirus spike protein into the virus. So it's it's similar to, though the, the adenovirus that's being used is different than the AstraZeneca vaccine, but it's a, it's the, conceptually it's the same approach that's being used. So it's a genetically engineered adenovirus from another uh, host, not, not, a, not, not a human adenovirus, but a different one. And that one, the, the, the unique thing about that is that they have tested that clinically and it generates a pretty good immune response with just a single admit, single dose administration. That's the unique thing about it. And it another thing about it that's handy uh, for rural parts of Minnesota and, and rural areas uh, in the United States and probably underdeveloped countries is that it just needs to be refrigerated at uh, rigor refrigerator temperatures and it, be, it can be stored like that for up to a month. Yeah, Lou, let's let's keep going with that storage thing. Can you answer the question, why does the Pfizer vaccine require super cold storage? I, I believe that, I don't know for sure. My guess is that it's the, 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 the formulation of that lipid nanoparticle. That's, that would be the one thing that would probably require that. It's, there's probably something, these are all proprietary. Even though if you see the, uh, the information sheet for those that get it vaccinated, they're probably not giving it out, but you can go online and look at them and they will give you the, the ingredients of the, the different vaccines for both. Uh, I've looked at them for both the Moderna. When they issue the EUA, they, they also issue the information packet that will go with the vaccine for, for people that are inoculated. So you can look at that. I've looked at both of them. They're not, in terms of the lipid nanoparticle formulation, it's not identical, but I suspect it has something to do with that formulation. That's the, the difference between the Pfizer and the Moderna. I have heard that Pfizer is trying to develop another one that doesn't require that uh, deep, deep freeze storage. Yeah, I'll just add a comment here too, is the way vaccines are um, developed and approved, a company asserts that they they're they want to store it at this temperature and they test it at that then they can't go back and distribute it at when it's stored differently so once it's tested at that temperature of storage that's the way we have to deliver the vaccine until it can be retested so it may well be that it doesn't they really have the same temperature storage requirements but we just can't follow that yet okay um I want to direct this next question to Dr. Uh, Varen. Can you get the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine if you're under 18? You're muted, Jason. So actually right now, um, you would have to be in that category that it, it goes down to because we are, we are going in, in certain categories. Um, I am not absolutely sure about that if it, if it wasn't being rolled out in, in different categories, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I can, I can chime in on that. So the, the current answer is no, you cannot. It was only approved for 18, year 18 and up, but I, there are ongoing clinical trials of younger people to, and the hope is that by the time we reach the end of the summer, Obviously, there'll be a lot more vaccine available, but they'll have done more clinical studies that hopefully um, under 18 will be available to be uh, vaccinated probably before they would go back to school in the fall. And hopefully by that point, we've got you know massive vaccination campaigns. So that, that's being 
uh, the EUA was for, for both of them was for age 18 and older, but they're doing clinical trials right now for, for younger ages. Okay, here's an interesting question, maybe Lou, that you and I can answer. Is the vaccine likely to become seasonal, like the flu shot? Due to the less than 100% immunity and appearance of mutated viruses, um, is this going to need to be seasonal and do we need to continue wearing masks? I think we've already covered that. For the time being, it is a good idea recommended to continue wearing masks. But let's talk about whether this might become a seasonal vaccine. Well, let's first start off. Is this a virus that's going to disappear from the human population anytime soon? No, actually, I, I, this this is a virus that's endemic in the human population. It's always going to be, there's too many people infected now. There's way too many people infected. We'll never get rid of it. Actually, I, I should point out that everybody's heard of the polio vaccine, right? That was developed in 1950s. There are still people that are, there are still a couple of locations on the planet that are endemically infected with polio. We still haven't got rid of polio yet. And this is gonna be a problem. There may be certain locations on the planet. Even if everybody agrees to be vaccinated, there will still be certain locations. So uh, right now it's still not entirely clear when, presumably this is a respiratory virus. You could envision it would be seasonal. I don't know when that's gonna happen, but uh, the viruses, is in the human population regrettably to stay, which means as long as it's there, it's adapting and mutating and evolving. And But my guess is that there will be some point where it's going to pivot and it will become more seasonal. It is interesting though, we're right in the middle of February, right? And yet these, uh, I don't know if it's in the chat or not, maybe Chris can respond to this because it is somewhat of an immunity question that it's interesting that the, the the number of infected people is dropping and we're still right in the middle of winter time. So why is that happening right now? I've had several people ask me, why is that happening right now? Yeah, I, don't, I just wanna comment on whether we might have a different um, COVID-19 vaccine every year like we do for influenza. Um, it's fair to say that the COVID-19 mutation rate is nowhere near as high as influenza, but there is a huge viral burden on this planet right now of COVID-19. So we have these variants arising. Once it gets under control, it's unclear to me and I believe to the scientific community as well, whether we're gonna to need to have a different vaccine every year for COVID-19. Like we do. Yeah, it's not clear if it'll be every year or every other year, but there will be um, yeah, new vaccines that will, I think will definitely be needed as time goes on. It's just inevitable that that, just the biology of the virus would kind of dictate. Uh, that gets into a whole another topic is whether or not the coronavirus's mutation rate, how different that is compared to flu. It's probably not dramatically different, but that's it's a deep in the weeds discussion. So I wanna go there. Dr. Varan, what are the negative side effects for the COVID-19 vaccine? Well, I think that's gonna vary from individual to individual. Um, I'll tell you that I had a similar reaction to what my um, influenza vaccine is each year. And that it feels like maybe somebody uh, gently punched me in the arm and it's sore for a day or two. Um, I've heard that the second uh, round of, of vaccine tends to have more likelihood of side effects. And that kind of makes sense, right? Because the first vaccine you're getting, you're, you're exposing uh, this new protein to your immune system, and it's building up a response. So that second uh, vaccine is like a booster, and there's already this uh, immune response ready to uh, attack it or to, to take it out. So it's not a bad thing when you have symptoms, but you're likely to have some, uh, some chills. Some people will have more soreness than in the arm, uh, maybe a, a slight fever. You feel almost like um, if you've ever had a cold or, or uh, gotten ill, it's kind of like that, that first day that you're starting to get sick. You have this, this, this un, it's not a good feeling, but it's very short lived in most cases. Uh, anybody who I've talked to that did have a response like that's only lasted a couple of days. Um, I've had several of my, my colleagues that have gotten both uh, vaccinations and sore arm has been the extent of it, so. 
Thanks. We'll pivot a little bit now. And um, I want to ask, raise up this question that was in the chat. How effective is our strategy to reach out and pull in people of color in the trial phases? And then I'd like Dr. Nunez to comment on in our vaccination effort as well. Um, I'm not aware of the answer for how effective was our strategy to pull in people of color in the trials. Um, and Dr. Varn Amansky, do you know the answer to that? What was the, say, say the question again, sorry. How effective was our strategy, strategy to reach out and pull in people of color in the trial phases? I know in the Twin Cities, Chris, that this has been, um, I actually just saw an interview with uh, a, a while ago with uh, Dr. Frank Rehm at Avent Northwestern. And I know that this, this is a challenge, it just at least in the Twin Cities area, I would think just throughout the state, it's not, it's not that easy. And there's, you know, I can't fully, it's a little bit outside of my area of expertise to fully explain why that is other than there could be, you know, shyness that, I mean, there's clearly people that are concerned about the vaccine the rate at which it was developed. There was a question in the chat, you know, should we be concerned that it was developed this quickly? No, I don't think there's any any real reason to believe that it's less safe because of how quickly it was developed. There was probably like, 50, oh, I can't remember the number. It's like 20, 15 to $20 billion investment. Normally it takes, if you wanna know how long does it take to develop a vaccine, it's usually about 15 years on average, but usually there isn't like $15 billion put up front to develop the vaccine. That that helped accelerate things quite a bit, as you can imagine. But there's clearly hesitancy in uh, communities of color. To, and I think that's probably the main reason why it's been difficult to, my understanding, it's been difficult to recruit uh, people to be vaccinated. Thanks. Um, here's a question. Does it matter if we immunize the US and fail to do so in the rest of the global population. It is very important that we have the global population vaccinated as well as the US. Um, the only situation under which that would not be the case would be A, if we were only considering US citizens and B, if we were not to have any more contact with the rest of the world. And that is completely unlikely. So no, it's very important that um, that the immunization strategy is effective globally. And there are so many um, exciting efforts to do that. Um, and I think one, um, the, the viruses, the um, AstraZeneca and the J&J &J viruses that, only, that have less stringent temperature storage requirements and only have to be given once will go a long way toward um, global vaccination efforts as well. Um, Dr. Nunez, this question I'd, for you. I'm a small business owner. Could, should I put up a homemade sign that says, please get vaccinated. We owe it to each other. I patronize quite a few businesses, large and small, and have not seen any reference to getting vaccinated, only the mandatory mask signs. What a great question. Uh, my knee jerk is absolutely, you know, it's interesting going into a store the other day, one store said, because of government regulations, you must wear a mask. Another store said, because we want you to be safe, we invite you and it's a rule, you have to wear a mask in the store. Um, I thought it was very interesting that they both said that you had to wear a mask, but why you did it and, and the motivation were very, were very different. Um, I think that the question will be, when vaccinations are available, because um, I think that that's uh, a frustration. Um, even amidst, amongst communities of color who have hesitancy, they're saying, when's the vaccines going to be out there? You know, when will we be able to sort of, you know, what, when's our number come up in terms of doing that? At the point where we're having sort of a sufficiency in terms of vaccinations, absolutely. I think we should invite everyone to take care of each other, um, which means even if you got vaccinated, to keep wearing your masks, um, because you don't know if this person might be sort of immunocompromised or something else is going on. Um, there was a thing in the chat that said that we've seen that there's fewer colds, there's fewer episodes of influenza this season, probably because of those measures. Um, you know, who knew? It's like, instead of you know, saying to somebody, get a flu shot, sort of wear a mask. Um, you know, it may be sort of the new norm in terms of decreasing types of infections, but I would strongly encourage that we encourage each other in terms of getting vaccinated and sort of being safe 
to care for ourselves and to care for each other. I wanna follow up a little bit with another question from the chat for you, Dr. Nunez. Assuming that most of the US population, let's say we get 75, 80% or more are vaccinated, will we ever be able to go without masks or are masks the new normal now? <laughs> well, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I think that we know, at least in terms of influenza, that there are some viruses that are seasonal. Um, and if we could decrease getting influenza and sort of being sick and out of work for by wearing a mask, that's pretty compelling, um, both for employees as well as individuals who suffered, honest to goodness, influenza, not just a summer, a winter cold. Um, and so I think that there's going to be advantages. We're going to have to sort of think about sort of in the post-COVID space, what are changes that we made that we might want to keep because it's sort of better for us? And what changes do we want to sort of say, remember when? Um, and it may be that on an interval basis, depending on sort of what's happening, uh, masks, you know, we, we may get sort of the, you know, celebrity and fashion masks, and it's sort of the way to go uh, in terms of sort of people taking care of each other. And, an, and a final one for you, Dr. Nunez, a practical question. If you go to get vaccinated and if you're asymptomatic but infected, what will happen? Should testing be required before vaccinating? Well, first of all, people who have had um, COVID, and we know that about 40% can be asymptomatic with COVID, um, that somebody who has COVID still should get vaccinated um, in terms of being able to be protected. Um, a day, you know, sort of goosing sort of that immunity so that you can sort of be protected from further infection or reinfection is really important. Um, so I think that, um, you know, getting, getting sort of vaccinated is sort of the way to go, and there's no adverse effect in terms of doing that. Um, there have been, at least anecdotally, what I've heard that individuals who were very sick with COVID when they got vaccinated, they had sort of, you know, fatigue, they had a headache, they didn't feel very well because their immune system, back to what Dr. Varum said, had already been primed. And then they got vaccinated and you're like, oh, I remember that. <laughs> Here we go, right? And so if you're primed and you're, and, and you know, somebody in the chat talked about the immune system uh, and I'll share with you sort of a, a funny story. Um, as, as I would sort of immunize patients and this is just, you know, uh, with pertussis, whooping cough. Um, and I'd say, well, you know, when you get your immunization, you can have a really sore arm. It could be, you know, like spasm, it can hurt. So take some ibuprofen. And I had a patient come back and they said to me, you must be a wimp. And nothing happened to me. I was fine. That vaccination was easy peasy, right? And I said, well, I would rather be wrong and tell you to take it easy in, in case it did happen to you than not mention to you and have it happen, right? It varies. Our immune systems vary. And how it revs up in terms of that response can be very asymptomatic, feeling a little tired, a little feverish. That means you're sort of revving the engine from zero to 60 in terms of immune system. And yet the very next person with the same experience could go from zero to 200 and feel like they were about rolled over because their immune system was very robust. Both immune systems are working, but how it manifests depends on the individual. And recognizing that, and, and sort of as I mentioned in the chat, sort of especially with the second dose, hydrating well and taking ibuprofen uh, seems to be the way to go in terms of sort of having a, a reasonable course. Thanks. Okay, let's pivot back to the virus. There's a lot of questions still coming in about the virus. Lou, why didn't the earlier SARS virus spread as much as this one has? Okay, somebody knows some uh, virus biology. So the, the original SARS that was in the early 2000s, it was actually known to be, um, simple answer is we, we don't know, but uh, that early one in the early 2000s actually had a higher fatality rate, but it died out in the human population more quickly. It didn't become endemic. We don't know why that is. That's, so that remains an open question as to why, why that happened. But it's... It, we were in much better shape because there had been a SARS and a MERS, which is the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus, both are human coronaviruses, that if those had not emerged, we would have been even worse off because we would, as bad as things are, we'd have been in worse shape because a lot of the technology that, a lot of the knowledge that we have about coronaviruses have come from those two, the original SARS and MERS but we, the biology of why it died out, we don't know. Thanks. Um, this question is about a, a COVID therapy. Has there been testing for antibody dependent 
Oh, I'm sorry, this is not about a therapy, but has there been testing for antibody dependent enhancement with the current vaccines, Pfizer, Moderna, and soon J&J, &J, and is there any risk? You want to answer that one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this has been um, a big concern. Uh, this is probably a question asked by an, uh, an immunologist, maybe even. Um, there, there's been um, a couple of vaccines, notably dengue uh, vaccine, that actually uh, created enhanced uh, risk of symptoms instead of uh, protecting individuals. And that was due to a phenomenon called antibody dependent enhancement. And there was a great concern that COVID vaccines had the potential to show antibody dependent enhancement. And that has generally not been seen. And it, it's been a great relief with um, the vaccines as they've been rolled out so far, there hasn't been ADE um, observed. Um, here's another uh, vaccine question. Is there another option in the virus to target besides the spike protein? What about targeting mul multiple targets or antigens? Yep, that's a great question. Uh, there are other targets. The, um, the nucleocapsid protein of the coronaviruses is actually known to be fairly immunogenic. Uh, that could be another target. There's also other structural proteins, the M protein, the E protein. These are also on the surface of the, the virus particle. Those could also be potential targets. Everybody's been focused on this, be on the spike protein, because this is the main protein that's got to interact with that ACE2 protein in order to gain entry in the cell. So it's, everything's been focused on this. Dr. Tolar alluded to this in his introductory video, but uh, one of the amazing achievements, basic science achievements that occurred over a year ago now was that on January 11, 2020, the complete nucleotide sequence of the virus was released by the Chinese scientists in Wuhan to the world. That immediately was used by the vaccine companies to develop these RNA vaccines and to engineer all the other vaccine. So having that sequence was just absolutely critical. And so that was, and I heard that there was an argument and some interference by the Chinese government. They apparently delayed by a week the, the release of that sequence, but that's the basis for everything was the basic science of being able to quickly sequence the, the, the first isolate in Wuhan led to everything that we're seeing now was, and Dr. Tolar had alluded to that. Yeah. Okay, we're getting fairly close to the end of our time. And there's a question that came in in the chat that I think is really um, rich. And I'd like all the panelists to uh, weigh in on this. And the question is, how will the pandemic, along with the health disparities that it exposed, change healthcare in the future? Dr. Barron, let's start with you. Oh, it's so, it's a magic eight ball question. Um, I think that we will roll out of this better. I'm hoping that we will, because of course it has exposed a lot of, of different disparities, um, not only between um, uh, populations or communities of color, but rural communities um, that are still waiting to get the vaccine. We have uh, many communities that don't even have access to it or are not getting it in a, a timely manner. Um, so I'd like to think that it's going to enhance our ability to deliver care to all of our, our community members um, by practicing. Uh, I don't know if that will be the case, but I think practice hopefully makes perfect. And as I said, the, most institutions or, or things in life are not perfect, but as long as we keep working to, to improve them, um, that will help. And, and I, I really hope that um, the way that this is being handled and continues to be handled builds trust in, in all of our, our, our people, uh, uh, regardless where they are. Uh, we need to trust each other and we need to get through this together. We can't do it by ourselves or in a divided fashion because it just won't work. So hopefully that will uh, uh, pull us together and will help us long term. Excellent optimism then that lessons learned will improve our abilities to deliver healthcare in the future. Lou, from a virologist perspective, how has the pandemic 
uh, how will it change uh, science in the future? I, I think it's it will have a transformative impact on on science. So obviously, be people studying uh, coronaviruses. Everybody's a coronavirologist now, in one form or another, and it's just amazing. Uh, all the disciplines, certainly at a land grant university like the University of Minnesota, it's amazing all the disciplines that have been engaged in the past year. Every, every corner of the university has been involved in the university's response, but just speaking about like the virus biology, these are actually really complicated viruses to study. Uh, the RNA of the virus is 30,000 bases long, it, which is a gigantic RNA virus. It uh, encodes for a lot of genes. It's actually not easily manipulated in cell culture, which is how you grow the viruses in the laboratory. So there's going to be a lot of uh, you know molecular virology that's going to be not needed to be done to really fully you know develop ways of of studying the virus carefully. But it's a real tough virus to study. A lot of the studies that have been done have been using bits and pieces of the virus to be able to extract information about the biology of the virus so it's but it'll be studied for for decades easily decades so do you think we're going to end up developing a biomedical national guard or do you think that this experience proved that our system can respond very effectively and timely I think it's pretty clear. I can probably speak for everybody that there's probably new investment that needs to be made in terms of uh, surveillance, looking for uh, for new viruses, new pathogens that could enter. You know, we live in a global community, right? Right now, right? We know that somebody could could be exposed to a virus anywhere on the planet. Jump on a plane within 24 hours, they could be somewhere in the United States. This happened with Ebola. If people remember the stories about Ebola that there was somebody exposed in Africa to Ebola. Jumped on a plane, and we had an, uh, an Ebola infected person in Texas within 24 hours, and people were trying to track down. So there was a government response to that. You know, that's that's a different kind of virus. It doesn't spread. It's not a respiratory pathogen doesn't spread as easily but so the, at that time there had been the beginnings of a government response but I think it's pretty clear that they're going forward there should be a, a very strong investment in in surveilling one thing that what that's somewhat related to this is that you know we hear everything about the vaccines but there's still really a, a strong need for antiviral therapeutics that, that we still, you know, the best case scenario is that we have both vaccines and antivirals to, for, to treat those that have been infected. That's still something that is clearly in the pipeline. There's still a lot more effort and investment that's needed to develop antivirals. And because these viruses are so unusual, there's a lot of need for government investment in that kind of research. We can't rely solely on the private sector to do that. Thanks. And last but not least, Dr. Nunez, I'd like to hear your perspective. How will the pandemic change things going forward? So I'm going to weigh in as, in, as a, a fellow optimist in terms of sort of um, moving things for the better. Um, first off, in terms of access, um, prior to COVID, people said, we can't do telemedicine or you can only do telemedicine if somebody lives 300 miles away. It's not feasible. We can't figure it out. The logistics are too hard. Um, and now we have telemedicine. Um, and telemedicine may actually be useful in urban centers as it is rural centers. Um, and so there might be places where we see sort of telemedicine consider continuing in terms of access. So I think that that access is going to be sort of different in a post-COVID world. Um, agreeing in terms of, sort of the investment piece, um, science came out. You know, it, it sort of showed its stuff in terms of sort of the investment in science to do something pretty darn miraculous in a very short period of time. And so it speaks to the need to invest in science as well as to invest in the public health infrastructure. Prior to COVID, we had a healthcare financing infrastructure for health, but we really had sort of stripped away in terms of a public health infrastructure and sort of I think is gonna be the next way to go to address the next pandemic as well as moving forward in terms of health. And then the third piece is that we collectively have to sort of keep on whittling way in terms of health disparities. We have to sort of say, you know, on a good day for an average person, it's difficult to go get health care. It's, you know, it's difficult to take care of yourself, right? How can we do better than that? 
and then do that for everyone in terms of addressing sort of where are those gaps. Um, so I think that that's where we see in terms of sort of moving forward to sort of really change the arc in terms of improvement. Well, thank you all to our panelists for your time and for sharing your insights into COVID vaccines. We would also like to thank you, our participants in the Mini Medical School for joining us today. If you'd like to learn more about today's topic, make sure to look through the supplemental materials provided in the reminder email that was sent out on Friday. We'll see you next week for the second Mini Medical School session on COVID-19, The Way Forward, which will be at the same time next Monday. We have an amazing group of experts that will discuss advancing health equity during a pandemic. See you there.